This video was created as a final project for the Florida Master Naturalist Program's Coastal Module. Three of us decided to get together and explore Florida's coastal habitats, taking what we have been learning into the field and bringing you, the viewer, along with us. With its rising population and booming tourism industry, Florida's fragile coastline has been scarred by development and other human activities. Once pristine habitats are now littered with condos, restaurants, and other public amenities. Fortunately, efforts are underway to try and bring back some of Florida's native habitat by preserving undeveloped land along its coast, restoring plant communities, and protecting endangered animal species. I don't know if everybody knows what these are. Many Floridians do. You can see these structures on the beach from April, generally very late April, into October, maybe the beginning of November. And we get a lot of visitors and lots of them have no idea what this is. This is a marking of a sea turtle's nest. They are considered a threatened species. They used to be endangered, but it's gotten a little bit better through the years, and so now they're threatened, but obviously that's still a problem, and so we keep, keep track of them. So I'm down here close to the edge of the water, and you can see there's a deep incline coming down, going out to the water, and this gal weighs 250 to 300 pounds. Now she waits until nighttime because it's not as hot, and it's very strenuous for her. She's not used to being on land. She spends most of her time in the water, except for when she comes to lay her eggs and make babies. So she's coming up here, and it's very, very slow, and she's very, very tired. It looks like if you've ever seen a bulldozer and the tracks that a bulldozer makes at a construction site, that's actually what it looks like if she comes up on the beach. The volunteers, these volunteers work out of Moat Marine in Sarasota. All volunteers, they come out here at six o'clock in the morning to look for tracks and mark the nests and also come out and look at the nest to see if anybody's hatched or not. Now this particular turtle laid these eggs on June the 2nd and this indicates that it's a 53rd nest on the on the beach. She has comes up and she digs out, she maneuvers herself and she ends up digging a very deep hole to lay her eggs. Now remember at this time she's lumbered up here and she's tired, but she starts laying her eggs and she basically lays about 80 to 100 eggs in that hole, sort of soft, but, but leathery, so they're not gonna break easily. And she drops those in and then she covers them up and then she starts back and she walks back the way I just showed you, back again to the water. Now, the men, the males out there, they stay out in the water. They don't come on shore. And she mates with them one time, generally in April, and that enables her to come in and actually nest two to five times a season. If the sand is cooler, the turtles tend to be more male. And obviously that's on a gradient, depending on how cool the, the sand is. The hotter and the warmer the sand, you end up with more females. It takes sometimes two to three days for these little tiny guys to come up out of that hole. They are climbing over each other. Some of them hatch out of the eggs before the others, but they keep moving and working. And finally, some of them make it to the top and open up the sand, and then they all start scurrying. They hopefully will do this at nighttime where there's a little bit of protection for them because they are like caviar and good morsels of lobster or something to other seabirds and any other animal that might be around. Now, there's a law that says that people along the beach need to keep their lights covered and not shining out here on the beach. These little guys want to head instinctively toward light and the water shimmers for them at night. Well, even if there's not a full moon, that water is shimmering out there and they head that way. If they come out, however, and they see 
lights up here on the beach from hotels or somebody's house or what have you, many times they will head that way. They end up in a parking lot, very confused, out on a road, and they die because they have lost their way. Statistics have shown that only one out of a thousand little guys running toward the water make it. Amazingly, if the one out of a thousand lives, that turtle may live up to 75 to 100 years. Florida's coastal uplands are of critical importance to native wildlife. Water birds, reptiles, amphibians, small mammals, and numerous invertebrates all rely on these shoreline beach and plant communities for habitat. So the thing I find really interesting about shorebirds is the fact that they're ground nesters. When you think of birds nesting and things like that, we always think of looking for them in trees. But these little guys can nest anywhere from our coastal beaches to our uh, barrier islands, causeways, um, they've even been known to nest at construction sites and on gravel rooftops. Some of the beach nesting birds common to our area here in southwest Florida are the snowy plover, Wilson's plover, the willet, and then you can even get some seabirds like the uh, least tern and the black skimmer. It's important if you come across one of their nests to give them plenty of space. You don't want to force them to fly off because this could expose the eggs to heat and possibly predators. Shorebirds are very important to our ecosystem. Their droppings help fertilize the waterways and the mudflats they fly over. This in turn helps the microscopic plants, known as phytoplankton, grow. And phytoplankton is the base for the food web for all of the ocean's fishes. The plants growing along our coastline have an important role to play in helping to stabilize this sandy, always shifting substrate that makes up our beaches. Those that form the dunes are the ones most affected by high winds, salt spray, storm surge, and even human disturbances such as trampling. You'll notice that they tend to be shorter and grow closer to the ground. These plants must be able to survive in very dry conditions of high salinity with very few nutrients. Some of these plants, like the prickly pear cactus, for instance, can be found growing in desert habitats. We also see succulents, such as marsh elder and seaside purslane. What happens is, as pioneer species like vines and grasses take hold, sand begins to accumulate around their base, forming the dunes. Then shrubbier plants like sea grape, ink berries, salt bush, and gray knicker bean, along with other hardy plant species, form layers of protection that provide vital habitat and nesting places for wildlife. On the back side of the dunes, the soil becomes more stable. In this transitional zone, the soil tends to be a little more fertile from leaves, twigs, berries that fall to the ground. This humus layer helps in moisture retention. Here we see cabbage palm, salt palmetto, beach sunflower, indigo berry, Florida privet, ground cherry, and the sea oxide daisy, just to name a few. Further back in the maritime forest area, which is a little harder to find here in southwest Florida since most of our coastline has been developed, this area holds an even greater variety of plant and animal species. Many of these plants are more shade tolerant as they grow under the canopy of 
taller trees and shrubs. The soil tends to be moderate to alkaline and can consist of shell fragments. Here we find strangler fig, gumbo limbo, buttonwood, myrcene, and wild coffee. Some exotic plant species have become invasive, including the Australian pine, Brazilian pepper, and seaside mayo. This can displace native species by competing with them for things like space, water, light, nutrients. This is one of the many factors that is contributing to the loss and fragmentation of natural habitats. From the maritime forest area, these coastal habitats begin to change as they move either toward more inland plant communities or toward the mangrove-lined edge of an estuary. The conservation and restoration of coastal habitats depends upon the joined efforts of governmental and non-governmental agencies along with the individual efforts of private citizens. By creating access to natural spaces, local residents are able to appreciate their natural environment and become engaged in its protection. Trails provide a wonderful way to enable access into environmentally sensitive areas with minimal impact. Studies have shown that spending time outdoors reduces stress, eases depression, and is of great benefit to our overall mental and physical health. We are able to gain a better understanding of our interconnectedness with the natural world.